Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this lecture, which is somehow a warming up for the big official celebration of Patron Saints Day next Thursday. Since some time, we know the names of five people who will be awarded an honorary doctorate because they are considered really as front runners uh, in their field, uh, as well as advocates of society on different issues. And one of these names is, and that's thanks to the nomination by the student delegation, Dr. Karen Sandler, sitting here. Um, it was the vice rector of research that asked me to do this introduction, and I do this with great pleasure, because also the topic is something I'm really interested in. Karen is a firm believer of software freedom. And in my own research field, I should also maybe uh, give some information on myself, I am a professor of intellectual property law. So I teach students about the legal protection of, amongst other things, software. And I also have some parts on open, explaining the difference between proprietary software and open source software. I'm also head of CTIP. CTIP is the Center for IT and IP Rights at the Law Faculty. And we do a lot of research, not only on open source, but also the data issues, property of data, and so on, personal, non-personal data, especially in relation to health. And I already admitted to Karen that our researchers, or many of them, have signed a letter to the IT responsibles at this university that we should switch to big blue button. But, uh, and I read in your uh, article that that is also one of your um, favorite programs. So as you all, I am eagerly looking forward to hearing the insights of Karen. But before giving her the microphone, I should say a few words on her career. I will be brief because otherwise I risk using up the full lecture time and that is not something I want to do. Karen began her career as a lawyer after having received her law degree from Columbia Law School. She also holds a Bachelor of Science in Engineering from the Cooper Union. Amongst many other things, she currently is Executive Director of the Software Freedom Conservancy, which is a non-profit organization that supports initiatives that make technology more inclusive and promotes free and open source software, FOSS. A mouthful of words, but it, in essence, all boils down to two big words, software freedom. Karen has earned numerous awards and recognitions, but I invite you to check her website and explore these things yourself. Karen, it is truly an honor to have you with us today, and without further ado, I gladly invite you to take the floor. Thanks, Professor. That was such a wonderful introduction. I, I would like to hear you give this talk. <laughs> Maybe some other time we'll, we should jointly do one. Um, uh, so I'm so happy to be here um, with you today. I'm, I'm going to give you a, um, a story about myself and my work and how I got involved in software freedom and um, how that impacts our, um, my view of how technology is in our society and um, where we should go from here. So to start, I need to tell you something about myself that I still, to this day, even though I have done probably 15 years worth of advocacy on this particular point, uh, always talking about my medical condition is, uh, is always a little stressful, but I have a heart condition. I literally have a big heart. It's called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and my heart isn't just um, big, it's really thick, and so it's really stiff when it beats. And what that means is that I am at a very high risk of suddenly dying. Um, the medical term is actually sudden death. Um, so that's okay because I have a pacemaker defibrillator that is implanted in my body. This picture is actually the pacemaker defibrillator that I used to have that you can see kind of a dent 
in it. That's because it was where it was kind of pried out. <laughs> um, and I have one here, if anyone is curious, can see it after. Um, this is the model I have now, which is a different device. Um, so when I got this device, I was astounded by how little the doctors knew about the technology that they were plant implanting into patients' bodies. They had not, for one minute, thought about the fact that there was software on those devices, and it had not even occurred to them that you could interact with that technology and that anyone other than the medical device manufacturers could have any control over it. Because I was an engineer turned lawyer, my first questions were about, you know, can I see the software on my device? I mean, I wanted to know about the safety and efficacy, and to do that, what better way than to review the software on my device, um, in addition to whatever other materials that I could find. And of course, what I found, which won't surprise anybody, oh, let's take a poll. How many people here are um, engineering or computer science students? So that's like, I'd say like a third, maybe even more. Um, anybody here studying law? Oh, amazing, that's like a quarter. Um, what else should I ask to know who else is here? Uh, students, raise your hand. And that's like a third. And uh, any faculty members? So like a few. Okay, this is amazing, welcome. Um, so normally, uh, audiences kind of cluster in one area or another, and this is really cool because you're all here in one place. Um, and so it, with, with my background, um, you know, this launched me into a whole research area, and because I, was a, I brought the legal skills, I decided that, um, well, first, my inner engineer took over, and so I asked the company for the source code, of course, with no avail, going through phone trees, talking to people, the, all of my medical professionals, the doctors that I worked with and the um, nurse practitioners um, couldn't really understand why I was asking these questions or even what my questions meant. Um, and ultimately, I kept getting shoved into various phone trees to no avail and being told that someone would get back to me, and nobody ever did. Um, so I decided to file a bunch of Freedom of Information Act requests in the United States to see what I could find about the FDA process in the United States, the Food and Drug Administration process about these devices. And what I found was that there really wasn't very much review at all on the software. That in fact, in the United States, we relied on the companies who test these devices to provide the reports about the safety of these software on the devices. Um, and so um, this launched me into an existential crisis about my body. The night before I became, I, before my surgery where I got the defibrillator, I had a party which was a cyborg becoming party. I thought, well, if this is going to happen, we're going to do it right. Um, and I realized that as this software was becoming a part of my life and my body, it also had to become a part of my work. Um, and so um, I started I, I, I used to think that open source was really cool. Um, raise your hand if you are familiar with the term open source. That is almost everybody. Raise your hand if you're familiar with the term free software. That's almost everybody again. This is so great, I'm gonna skip this. Fantastic. Anyway, because of all of, and sorry for people in the live stream, um, but there is a lot of uh, resources. Go to sfconservancy.org. If you click on the, um, the learn more about Visio button, um, you'll see, and I'll get to that later, but there's a lot of introductory resources. Um, so, uh, so I work at the Software Freedom Conservancy where I was a co-founder. Software Freedom Conservancy is a US-based charitable organization where we have three major um, areas of our work. The first one is we, um, we cannot um, expect people to move away from proprietary software if they do not have alternatives to move to. So we are a fiscal sponsor and we have a lot of uh, member projects that are developing free and open source solutions that we can use instead of um, proprietary software. And so that's our first branch. Our second branch is called Outreachy, 
And, um, and this came about because as, um, as, as, as people in um, a deeply technical field, we realized that that field was not well represented. Um, it started out personally, where, um, where folks realized that um, uh, when we asked people to apply to programs and participate in our events, there simply were no women. Um, and personally for me, um, I noticed that uh, at so many conferences, I was the only woman in really a sea of people. Um, and it was, uh, it, was, it was deeply surprising um, and, uh, and often off-putting um, the number of sexist comments that were made, um, assumptions about um, my capabilities um, were very demoralizing. Um, I uh, would stand next to another executive director of a nonprofit in tech who was a man, and people would assume that he had a technical background, and I didn't. But he was a marketer, and I was an engineer. <laughs> it was very surprising. Um, and so, um, and so not just, not from my personal experiences, but, uh, but from the experiences of the community, um, a, a woman named Marina Zorahinskaya, who unfortunately died um, in June of breast cancer um, after a wonderful three-year fight. Um, uh, she founded this, um, this program with the GNOME Foundation, and I came soon after, and we built it up together. This program provides internships to people who are subject to systemic bias and who are impacted by underrepresentation. And the idea is that our experience was as women and the dearth of women in technology and in the field was really um, uh, stark, but the discrimination runs deep in technology in general. Um, and in order to rectify it, we need to do something actively to invite people. Um, technology not only um, has a, a horrible impact by reinforcing the biases of the people who make it, um, but we know that our technology will not serve everyone until it is made by everyone. And so giving people a chance to overcome the biases and discrimination that they have experienced has become an important part of the program that we do. So we call it Outreachy. It's an internship program where we do paid remote internships twice a year um, with open source communities. Um, students are very welcome, but you don't have to be a student to apply to it. Um, just tell us about the systemic bias and underrepresentation that you've experienced, um, and that's the eligibility. And then it's it's an amazing mentorship program. Um, anyway, it's uh, it's been running for over ten years now, and this summer we'll get to a thousand interns. I am really really excited about that. Um, and so uh, that is the second area. The third area of the work that we do at Software Freedom Conservancy is, um, is focusing on copyleft. Raise your hand if you are familiar with, the, with copyleft licensing. Okay, so that's about half of the audience. Copyleft licensing is a form of free and open source software. So it's a subset of licenses that are, um, are free and open. Copyleft licenses are licenses that have a provision that people call reciprocal. Um, detractors used to call it viral until viral was cool. Um, and it basically are licenses that say, you can do whatever you want with this software. You can study it, you can share it, you can make changes, you can share those changes, but if you distribute it or share those changes, you must do it under the same license. And you must give rights to everybody who receives it. And so with at Software Freedom Conservancy, we are the folks that stand up for these licenses when companies violate them. And I'll get more to that a little bit later. Um, and so doing this work at Software Freedom Conservancy, you know, it followed on that um, what I, the, trying to find ways to empower people um, impacted by technology in the face of the helplessness that I felt about my defibrillator. I just wanted to see what was inside my own body. And it was really about the accountability of it, the auditability of it. You know, if you can't review it, how do you know it's safe, right? If you can't test it, how do you know it's safe? Um, so I, for me, it was all about this kind of transparency argument. And then what's been so fascinating is that as I've lived with my device, different things in my life have come up from time to time that have changed my understanding of the ways in which technology impacts people. 
This is a picture of me when I was almost, I think I was nine months pregnant. Um, I, I, it was a fun trip, but, uh, but it was the very last one. Um, but yeah, so uh, when I was pregnant, uh, because I have a heart condition, my heart did, no, sorry, uh, I have a heart condition, but my heart was doing something that normal pregnant, like people without heart condition, pregnant women normally do. My heart was palpitating, which is something that happens to a quarter to a third of all women who have babies. Some people are nodding in the audience because they either experience this or know people who've experienced it. It's very, very common. But because I had a defibrillator and I was palpitating, my defibrillator thought that my palpitations were a dangerous rhythm and that I needed to be shocked. And so my defibrillator shocked me unnecessarily multiple times. And the only way to stop it from unnecessarily treating me and shocking me over and over was to go on drugs to slow my heart rate down. So I went on those drugs, which were okay. It was tough. It was hard to walk up a flight of stairs um, during that time but it was temporary, I took those drugs, it was fine, and the baby was born, being pregnant is a temporary condition, and here we are. But as I thought about it, I realized that 15% of defibrillators go to people under the age of 65. Only 15%, and only 44% go to women. So the set of people who are pregnant with defibrillators is teeny, teeny, tiny. My use case was simply not something that was contemplated by the manufacturers of the device. No one at the device manufacturer wanted pregnant people getting shocked. What a nightmare, right? And nobody wants that. You only make medical devices to help people, not to put them in trouble. But I was an edge case, something that hadn't been con contemplated. And consequently, because my use case wasn't the primary use case, I was out of luck. There was nothing I could do. I couldn't get together with all the other pregnant people and find out if we could adjust the algorithms on the software or take other precautions to try to evaluate if we could edit the software to make it different. I just had to stick with whatever the device manufacturer told me, and that was that. And uh, that helplessness made me realize that it wasn't just about the transparency and auditability of the source code, but it is about power. It is about control. It is about the ability to do something about your own situation. And having, this, having any software that you rely on isn't about whether something can go wrong. It's about when it will go wrong. I used to give talks about this, and I used to have to give all of these examples of, you know, I had pictures of hacked cars and pictures of, you know, which had funny pictures of people who thought, the car that thought it was in park, but it was going 100 miles an hour, you know, or whatever. Um, and, and all of these examples, new ones every year. But I don't need to do that anymore because there are so many examples of software being controlled either uh, through um, security researcher studies through actual malicious attacks or elsewhere in our society that I don't even need to establish it to you because we all know how dire it is. And it is not about whether something will go wrong, it's about when it will go wrong. And what will we be able to do about it when it does? Will we have to wait for the company that has the problem to admit that there's an error and then try to figure out what's wrong? Or will we have control over that technology ourselves so that we can do something about it and build organizational structures to be able to, um, to, to take action. Now, again, so many examples that come up every year. Um, one came up this last year that I wanted to highlight because it was so poignant. Um, these are pictures of patients who had an implant called Second Sight. Um, it was a, a, an ocular implant that allowed people who previously had lost vision to see, not you know, to see some range of vision. Um, the, um, the person um, on your right was, uh, was, uh, was on the subway, she recounts, the day when her implant stopped working. The company that made these devices, Second Sight, had run out of funding. It was a startup, it was very promising, it had early investment, 
but ultimately it did not have financial support. And so the software updates stopped coming and that hardware stopped working. People who could see could no longer see. These people have devices implanted in their bodies. They have implants in their eyes that it is dangerous to remove, that do nothing because they can't be updated um, or, and can't be repaired. And what's fascinating about it is that these devices could absolutely work if they could only have access to the software, if they could only update it. And uh, it's not just this one company's experience. The same thing has happened in other areas, cochlear implants. Um, there's a whole range of medical devices where this has happened, where startups have developed exciting, promising new technology and then re relied on VC and other investment and has, you know, those patients are just abandoned. You could have a whole other talk on standards and how the, the hardware component and, and other kinds of communication components absolutely need to be standardized. Um, uh, but the software component is one important piece of this. Um, and it's not just this tremendous number of medical devices that are in this situation. It's, it's almost every other device. I like talking about my medical device because it's deeply personal. I can tell you my experience and I can tell you what I know. But it's also a really easy metaphor. It's so critical to my life. It's literally sewn into my body and screwed into my heart. But it's not the only software that I rely on every day. And the thing is that we don't even know which software is going to be our most critical software. We don't know what software we're going to rely on that is going to fail because we rely on so much software for every part of our life, lives, for our most intimate communications, for our banking, for everything. And we are not in control as, as individuals as a public of a vast majority of that software. Um, so, uh, and, and, and one of the things that really astounds me is that a lot of companies that are distributing their software are doing so without ever having the source code of the software that they ship themselves. So they have a vendor that gives them the software, they put it on their products, they get it out into market, and even if there's a problem, those companies can't do anything about it. And so we're left with, we're, we're left with the short end of the stick. We're left with these devices that don't work and, um, and with, uh, with software that can't be adjusted to our use. So free and open source software is an alternative to this because if we had access to the source code, if we had access to that software, we would be able to change that software. We would be able to get together. Even if you are not a developer yourself, even if you're not technical, you could work with other people to do it. You could hire someone. Even if I wanted to hire, even if I were very wealthy and wanted to hire a medical professional to customize my defibrillator for me, I would be unable to do it. So with free and open source software, we have a chance. Free and open source software, it's funny, advocating for software freedom is tough because I can't say that open source software is better. I can't, I can't say that free software, there's something magic about free software where if you publish it, it's going to be, you're, you're gonna have a better experience, it will be safer or better or faster or more reliable. But what I can say is that with free and open source software, it has a chance we can test it and we can do something about it when things go wrong. And so uh, copy left its software um, in particular where we have this, um, this snowballing nature, right? Copy left its software is software where if, you're, if companies are distributing that software, they have to provide this, the source code um, when asked. Um, and those rights, um, uh, travel with the software. And so um, there's copy left its software in actually a ton of devices that are in the market. You basically can't go anywhere or do anything without encountering something that has Linux in it, right? Like, raise your hand if you have an Android phone. It's like three quarters of the audience. All right, I won't out the Apple people, but you know who you are. Um, so, uh, 
uh, and again, it's not necessarily that one is, is better than the other. Like some devices that are proprietary may be more secure right now. They may be, you know, they, they may have features that, um, that products that are based with more free and open source software products don't have. But over time, we are stuck not being able to make them the way we want them to be because they are proprietary and they're a complete black box to us. So the Linux kernel and other free and open source software products are, or software is on more than 80% of mobile devices if you count the Android market. And 90% of supercomputers, the New York Stock Exchange runs on it. It's basically in everywhere. It's also in TVs. And um, every product, if you go into a lot of kit kitchens and homes, you'll find lots and lots of devices. Now, I mentioned TVs because um, this is a, a Vizio TV. Um, and uh, Software Freedom Conservancy sued them. <laughs> and the reason that we sued them was because we wanted to use some Vizio TVs and they have copy lefted software in it. So we wanted to use those TVs for a variety of things. We have a few, um, uh, 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 some grants that we had written that we'd hope to be able to use these, um, these TVs for. But when we, uh, when we got the TVs, um, we, uh, well, we first got TV, <laughs> well, we got the original, we originally got some Vizio TVs and they had no, um, no, uh, no source or an offer for source. And we worked with Vizio to try to get into compliance. Um, and uh, after years of talking to them, um, they had provided some incomplete source code but had not come into compliance yet. And years later, when we went to buy some more TVs to do the product project we wanted to do, they had no, source or offer for source. So copyleft licenses require that you either have to provide the source code along with the distribution. So if you buy a TV, it's gotta have the source code on it. And if it doesn't have the source code, then you have to at least provide an offer. You have to tell people that it's there and you have to tell them how they can get it. Um, and these TVs didn't have either. Um, so even after us having talked to them, they were just flagrantly ignoring their obligations. And so we at Software Freedom Conservancy filed a lawsuit. But this lawsuit that we filed was a consumer rights lawsuit. The lawsuit was basically, uh, we, we filed it as a purchaser of televisions, which uh, with respect to copyleft licensing, I think has never been done before. And we said that because the license, the, um, the licenses of the software on the TVs gives rights to third parties. It says that, the, um, uh, that all third parties will have a, um, have a right where you have to make sure that they receive or can get the source code and that you must show them the, um, these terms so that they know that they have this right. Um, and so our lawsuit says that, um, that because we have this right, they have to give us the source code. Uh, which is also a, a, a third, it's called third party beneficiary in, um, in the United States and it's a contract law claim rather than a copyright claim. Um, and we, uh, we asked for what we call specific performance, which is uh, when you bring a lawsuit, you can ask for, um, for money usually. You can say, look, I've been injured here, somebody wronged me and, uh, and the way to handle it is that they need to compensate me and most consumer rights lawsuits that you hear about are class actions where they get settlements and everybody gets a payout of $10 or whatever. Um, but the amount in whole is great because it, it's a big penalty overall and it gets companies to change. Um, but what we're asking for is a little bit different in this case. It's a contract case, case and what we're asking for is the actual, excuse me, the actual software itself. Um, so, uh, so we want the complete and corresponding source code, which is what the license says that we're able to do, and the script we should be able to get, and the scripts to control compilation and installation. So we should be able to replace the software on the TV. The license says so, and we want to do it, and Vizio didn't even provide any offer for source or the source itself. And so uh, Vizio tried to, uh, tried to get rid of it by saying, oh, these people at Software Freedom Conservancy, they're really bringing a copyright case, but they're doing all this tap dancing um, to make it seem like a contract case. Um, but uh, and so they removed it to, um, to federal court in the United States, and the federal judge said, actually, these people have a claim. This, is co this, this sounds reasonable. So uh, it's been remanded back to state court. This stuff takes 
forever. It'll probably be a long time before there's any resolution or movement in it. But I wanted to talk about it because we're bringing these novel actions to connect the fact that, um, that people have to think about their technology in terms of how it impacts them and their lives. That we have to recognize that for millions of devices, we already have a right to see the source code on those devices. It's there. It's already there. We just have to ask for it, and we just have to use it. Um, and it's, you know, we used to have, this is like a real like old school, I like this picture because it reminds me of like an old America, you know, right? Like, and it's like this dilapidated TV repair shop. I remember when there were TV repair shops like in every couple of blocks in New York. I remember where people, you'd have to have it close because TVs were heavy. And there were so many people who needed their TVs repaired that you would see these all over. Now you don't see TV repair shops at all. And the reason is, is that when they break, it's often the software that isn't working. And people say, oh, it's dead. We need a new TV. Ah, oh, my phone stopped working, I need a new phone. And so we're throwing all of these devices that are perfectly serviceable if we could just update the software into a landfill. And companies are often deliberately not updating their old devices to get us to buy new devices. When the old devices work great, we just don't have any right to replace the software that came on them. But the trick is that for the vast majority of these devices, we actually do have a right. We just don't know about it and we just don't exercise it. Now, it can be different. Um, this is a picture of a, um, of a router because there's a project called OpenWRT, and that project was a result, it's a, it's a uh, free and open source software project. And that project came out of, oh, OpenWRT people, um, fans. Um, so uh, uh, that, that project came out of a, um, uh, a lawsuit seeking the source code. And when the source code, it was, it was a product of a, settle, of a settlement, and when the source code came out, um, a whole project uh, was born, and now loads and loads of people can replace the software on their routers, and there's a really vibrant community. And in fact, it's been good for some router manufacturers to make sure that their routers are, um, are, uh, are able to have, uh, have, are compatible with OpenWRT because people seek it out. And so there's a, there's a business case for it in addition. Um, and there are other projects like this. Um, OpenWRT is a Software Freedom Conservancy member project, so I had to highlight them. Um, but there are other projects as well that are like this. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it, we don't necessarily have to just rely on the device manufacturers to be the source of the software that runs on them. Raise your hand if you've replaced the software on a device with a free and open source software operating system or software of any kind. Yeah, it's like a third of the, uh, like, like a quarter, a third of the audience, which is really exciting. Um, and it's so exciting and powerful to do that because, well, it, it changes everything. Often at the point we're in now, you're trading off some features. You might not be able to do everything that you could do before, but you get to decide what software you put on it. You get to decide if you're gonna put some of the proprietary stuff on it, or you decide if you're gonna keep, you know, try to make as much free and open as you possibly can. And you decide when and how it gets updated. Some of these projects automatically update, and that's really wonderful for security updates. Um, now, I, I wanted to talk a, go back to my medical device situation a little bit. Um, this is a picture of me. It's an old picture of me getting my old device interrogated, um, and, uh, and interrogated is basically the word they use, which is actually, it sounds very like old spy movie, like I'm going to interrogate your device. But um, it, it just means that it's the reading of the device by a piece of equipment called a programmer. The terminology is so confusing. But, uh, but the device that reads it is called a programmer, and the programmer gets the information. Those are, have shown to be totally insecure also, where people have sold programmers to the, like, into the market from hospitals that had thousands of patients' data on them. Um, fascinating stuff. But in, in this instance, um, I wanted to highlight the fact that, um, that my medical saga continues, and that every time that I have something new in my life, I realize there are whole aspects of this that need to be explored. So um, this week, before I came here, 
I realized that I needed to find out something urgently about my defibrillator, um, and so I needed to get my device interrogated. But when I got my device replaced the last time, uh, which is right when this picture was taken, um, I was really concerned with the possibility that my device would be maliciously hacked. I told you about my work on Outreachy. A lot of people don't like work on diversity programs. They, um, uh, they think that they are misguided, um, and despite the fact that, um, that the studies show the impact that, um, that underrepresentation has in the field, and despite the fact that um, the tech industry is very obviously misrepresented, um, the uh, people are, it's a very polarizing issue. And so I've actually had a lot of threats related to my work on this, um, including rape and death threats, which is super weird. Um, and I'd like to not think about it too often. But in getting a new device, I, um, I did not want these dev my device to do what all of these devices do, which is to broadcast incessantly all of the time. Um, and previously, without very good encryption, especially uh, earlier on, and so or, or, or security protection. And so I got the one device that was available in the US market where you could switch off the remote telemetry, the broadcasting component. I got the only one device. I called all the device manufacturers. I had a great um, nurse practitioner who helped me out. She and I sat in a conference room and we called all of the device manufacturers. Uh, Biotronic was the most hilarious because they said, oh, you don't have to worry about ours. Our device is hack proof. And I was like, really, Biotronic? Why do you think that you're hack proof? Oh, because Medtronic has been shown to be vulnerable and uh, St. Jude has been shown to be, you know, uh, Gaiden has been shown to be vulnerable, but we've never, I was like, well, that's because you're the fourth size, and when people are showing the vulnerability of, of these devices, they're not gonna go with the fourth most popular, they're gonna go with the most popular. Could you send me some devices? And I'll, we'll, I'll get some volunteers and we'll test it. I'm still waiting. Um, but, uh, but I didn't get a biotronic device. I got a, a device manufacturer that, that I could, switch off the radio telemetry. So my device is not broadcasting, which means that I can't use like, um, uh, like a, they have a lot of black boxes that people can have in their homes that will monitor their devices. Um, but it also means that when I got this device, that company is a very large European company with a very small presence in the United States, but they were very present in the United States when I got my device. Um, and it was great because it's a very high quality device. And when I got it, uh, I got it years ago, and it still has enough battery life for 10 to 15 years, um, which is a very long time, and it's very exciting because it means I won't need surgery for that period of time. So that would be just wonderful. However, when I needed to get my device interrogated, I found out that the device manufacturer representative, who is the one who has this programmer in New York, had gone out of the country and guess what? There was no backup rep. No one. There was literally nowhere I could go in New York City. Some hospitals have the devices, but none of them were available for me to go to. I could not get the information off of my defibrillator. I just was out of luck. And I was just suddenly put in that same position as those vision patients. I, I could really feel, I mean, it's a very different situation. I'm still functional. It's, uh, and, and, uh, or I, I mean, I still, my heart is still, uh, is not completely reliant on this defibrillator. It's preventative. But I, I could understand, I could taste that, how, how hard that is. And, and the realization that I may need to get surgery to replace a perfectly functional device simply because this, manufacturer has decreased their presence. What good is a defibrillator if, if it can't be, if, if you can't get the information you need when you need it? Um, it's, not, um, it's not all bleak, it's really fascinating. There's some really excellent work that's been happening in the insulin pump space um, where people have actually exploited old insulin pumps um, and the fact that they have um, a security vulnerability and they use it to create another device that talks to their insulin pump to deliver insulin in a much more precise way, um, open APS, and it's a really amazing movement. Um, and so I wanna like, you know, amazing things happen when you let patients actually take control of their devices. The stories in the insulin pump space are amazing because there are kids 
that have insulin pumps whose parents are technical and are able to precisely monitor their um, insulin delivery. One story um, that I heard was a kid who, uh, who had gone to the nurse's office at school almost every day for a whole academic year. And then after using this, was only in the nurse's office like three or four times. It was amazing stuff. And it, it, this is life, life changing, right? And this is what happens when we allow patients to engage in their care and allow people to control their technology. And as I said, it's not just medical devices. Medical devices are poignant, but we have all of these ways that we can take control of our technology if we have the opportunity. We can get together and we can form the, um, the organizations that can do this work. We don't have to rely on these particular companies who, like my medical, de medical device manufacturer, may just not be tuned into our concern. We may be in a part of the world where that company doesn't really have an interest or doesn't have expertise. We may, that company may not have a very diverse team. The, um, if you've heard the, an amazing, um, there's an amazing uh, story about the, that was all over Twitter a few years ago of a, um, Soap, soap dispensers, and there are actually multiple brands of soap dispensers where if uh, someone with light skin puts their hand under the soap dispenser, it works great. But if someone with dark skin puts their hand under the same soap dispenser, nothing happens because they relied on light reflection in order to determine whether to dispense soap. And there just obviously was no one with dark skin on that testing team. Otherwise, they would have known, right? So we need to make sure that we are engaged with the creation of our technology, that our technology is created diversely, and that we don't leave it up to these companies who are only interested in their profit margins. You know, like, they don't want disasters to happen because their profit margins are often aligned with public health, but their goal is their profits. So what can you do? First of all, please, you're here, so I think you're probably doing this already, but have a dialogue about the big solutions that are possible. I am astounded still, as an American, that GDPR happened, and filled with gratitude for the protection that it has spilled over to the United States. And if you would ask many people prior to it, we would have said it was not possible. There is a possibility for mass reform if we look in every selection, or every way, right? If we look towards advocating for better legislation, requiring uh, the publication of, uh, of source code and giving users rights. We can talk about making sure that we as consumers buy copylefted products. We can talk about how we can, we can create solutions that we can rely on. And none of the solutions that will move us to a world with software freedom will happen overnight. None of them are easy. They're all hard. I was talking to somebody about this recently and they said, um, ah, yes, it's like, trying to ask everyone to give up Amazon. How do we do that now, right? None of these things are easy, but they are important and they are broad and sweeping and they are only going to happen with coordinated dialogue. You, everyone here in this room and listening on the live stream, you are the tech savvy population. You are the top knowledgeable people. It is time for all of us technologists to stop relying on big tech for our solutions. I was in a meeting with some of the most um, influential tech rights organizations in the world, and they are advocating against Google by using Google Docs and Google infrastructure. We are using all of these solutions that big tech provides us because they are convenient, but they are not in our long-term interests. And we have alternatives that are ready now. If you want to collaborate on a document, we at Software Freedom Conservancy maintain an Etherpad, which Etherpad is also a Software Freedom Conservancy member project. Um, you can use video chat using uh, Jitsi. Um, this is the, the meet.jit.c is the link. Um, I really have to give a plug for Big Blue Button because it's designed for academic use. And I think you should all um, join the charge to get this university to switch to Big Blue Button. It is perfect for that solution. Um, I have loved teaching classes on it, and I think it works great and it's very stable. Um, and then go ahead, and if you have old devices, just play and put an alternate distribution on it, as many of you have. If you have a phone, try putting Lineage or something else on it. Um, if you've got a laptop, if you're just trying it out for the first time, Ubuntu or Debian is really, really great. And you can save old equipment from going into landfills and make them perfectly useful. 
If more people use it, we have this like amazing spiraling situation where we don't have the buy-in for software freedom solutions, and so those solutions continue to degrade and they get a little bit worse and a little bit worse over time because people say, oh, it's just so convenient. I'm gonna use, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the, the Apple product or I'm gonna use, um, you know, the, the Google um, suite. And over time, we're just making more of that happen. So we have, to, we have to buy into it. The other thing I have to ask each and every one of you to do, when you buy something, if you see a license notice in it that says, you have rights with respect to some of the software in this device, and you get the manual that has the licenses in it, if it says, if it says, ask for the source code by emailing this address, please do it. Ask for it. Because right now, only the people who are really interested in modifying their software in a very intent way will ask, and then companies, it's very easy for them to ignore it. Even though the people who are asking are the ones who are gonna make software that everyone else is gonna use, because only one person or a few people, a handful of people asks, the company thinks nobody cares and they're not taking it seriously. And that's one of the things that we see over and over again until uh, we contact them being the Software Freedom Conservancy and they get nervous that we might take action if they don't listen to us. Um, nothing, nothing happens. And the reason why we filed that consumer rights suit was basically so that anyone who asked for the source code will be taken seriously. Um, and then please support and engage in the organizations that are trying to make these changes possible. Um, there's Ulysses on this, you know, that's active here, um, and I understand they have a, like an open source job fair that happens in this very building. Um, like engage in these local organizations because this is how we're gonna build the infrastructure that will make a change. It's funny because when I was a student, there was software freedom, like you could easily replace your the software on any of your devices and it was super easy. You had a fully free device that you had complete control over. Um, but it was, it, it, was, it was kind of hard to do and it was kind of a niche thing. And now, free and open source software is everywhere and in everything. But we actually have far less software freedom than we ever had before because we can't do anything with any of our devices. It's the lower layers that are free and open. And the only way we're gonna change that is by banding together and supporting these organizations. So I think I've gone a little bit long, but I think we have time for questions. Um, great. So thank you so much, and I would love to hear your questions, please. Are you, are you moderating the questions? Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, got No, you might have to just come here. It's open, open something. It's collaborative. <laughs> collaborative. Okay, I don't have a microphone, so uh, if you would like to ask a question, please um, speak very loudly. Um, yes, floor is open. There, please, go ahead. Shout. You're yes. a hardware security researcher. Yes, please, all hardware security researchers, please email compliance at sfconservancy.org. We have a lot of work that we would love for you to do. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's, there's, so, mu there's so much. And, um, you know, we are, we are a tiny organization. We have uh, six people on staff. Um, and we run our internship program that has 130 people every year. We have our 50 member projects that are um, building alternatives and we're, we do the lawsuits and protect copy left and we do all that with a really small staff and we rely on a lot of volunteers and that's really important because we're funded by the public primarily and grants and, um, and, and a huge amount of our work is done by volunteers and that's important not just because um, it gets the work done, but it's also because it shows us that this work is important. It's not enough that I think it's important. It's, it, it, it has to be that we as a community think that this is important and can work together. So I'd love to talk to you about that. How? How can come, oh yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. How can companies be incentivized to, um, to publish their source code? Um, and how can we get them to do it um, you know, on their own? And I've been wondering this for forever. I thought, I, you know, honestly, I was so naive when I started this work. I really thought that this is one of those areas where the corporate interests and the public good were aligned. I really thought that the business case for open source would carry the day. And that, in fact, and I think, I think that the originators of the software freedom ideology also thought that. And so many of the early developers, especially, for example, the Linux kernel developers and other original projects like that that were so ideological and so forward thinking, were so excited when they started, when their collaboration yielded amazing results and those results started getting adopted by technology companies. They, they, it was suddenly like, we've made this. Like, we've, this has happened because we've created something so useful that companies want to use it. And then companies hired all of those people. And now a very high percentage of those developers work at companies to work on those products. And many of them work on things that they think are important to improve the software, and many of them are still ideological. But the idea that we could do well by doing good was flawed because we have put so many of our resources into, uh, into corporate interest, into, into, into things that companies find either palatable or profitable. And what becomes overlooked is our ability as a public to do with our devices what we want to, our ability to stay free from surveillance, our ability to make sure that you know, we're not only not being spied on, but that um, we can use our devices not only for their intended purpose or other purposes, right? I, I, it's currently difficult to find a product on the market that doesn't phone home. You, like, there are smart toothbrushes where they're taking video of your teeth to send back to a centralized company and then also taking video of everything else in your house. And these companies are trying to collect as much information as they can because they want to be able to pivot whatever business model that they can. And this is so insidious that it's very hard to predict what the interests will be of those companies in the long run. And what we have found is that without tech checks and balances, um, the free and open source software is just exploited. And what we need is to have a public focused component of it. There, we used to, people used to say, from like the old days, and I know that some of you here are, have been involved in the community for a long time and some of you are new um, and haven't experienced it a lot, but in the old days people would say free software is an ideological movement and open source is commercial. And I used to fight so hard to say that's not true because open source sounds like it's just about seeing the code, but everyone would tell you that it's not open source if you don't have the ability to modify it. And free software, it sounds like it's just about price, but it is about rights, and it's really about the same thing. You, if you look at the definitions, they effectively say the same things in the end. But what was true about that that I missed is that, uh, is that we can't have it all. We have to prioritize the public good. We have to prioritize our ability to take control of our, of our technology. And I don't know. I, I guess I'd say that we've tried that experiment of trying to make it interesting and exciting for companies, and what happens is they engage only as much as they have to. They give up only as much as they absolutely have to. So the only way to incentivize them is to legislate it so that they must do it. Or we incentivize them by every single one of us only buys products that have copylefted software in them, and we tell companies that we're doing it. We ask for the source code, when they don't provide it, we say, well, oh, I'm never gonna buy your device again. And I'm telling everybody else, I'm writing an article to my local paper, I'm gonna find an alternative where I can get the source code and I'm gonna support it. And I think that's the only way, because otherwise we're just kidding ourselves. Okay, I think there's time for one more question. Oh, this is such a great question. How do you manage the risks and liability? What if somebody working on your defibrillator gets it wrong? And the secret answer, like the, the real answer to this question is that software is full of liability because software is vulnerable. And just because something is free and open source doesn't mean that it is any 
uh, any more vulnerable. In fact, it's the opposite way around. And security researchers have found that devices that have free and open source software, there's like a, a more complicated answer to this that I'm gonna skip. But, uh, but they call what you're talking about um, security through obscurity. So if you don't publish the source code, then you're safe. But in fact, that's not the only, like there are many ways to, you can talk to the gentleman in the back. There are so many ways to, um, or I'm sorry for gendering the person in the back. I don't know why I did that, I apologize. Uh, but, um, but there are so many ways that you can, um, that you can, you can uh, show a device to be vulnerable and exploit it. And so having real security on devices, having, um, you know, having encryption, having real security, not this, not security theater. I mean, that's really where it's at. I, for example, I want the software on my device to be published and available for review, but I want there to be, I, I don't want any, I want there to be either a, a password or encryption or some way that only my device can tell, and, that, and, that's, and that's real. Because previously these devices had, no, had none of that before, but this device, the software wasn't published, and so, Researchers show that you could just sh cause them to shock people unnecessarily. You could get information off of those devices. So the question is, like, how do we manage our software liability? And it's scary stuff. But having the software public means that it can be reviewed and it can be tested. And yes, there might be times where, um, where folks who are malicious may be able to find an exploit by examining the source code. But because there are so many exploits available without access to the source code, it's just one of the, the benefits vastly outweigh the, um, you know, the risks in my, in my view. And as we develop more infrastructure around free and open source software projects, we'll find that to be the case. An example, perfect example of this is the Linux kernel, which is considered to be one of the most secure um, kernels. Um, and that has been free and open for 30 years. Oh, I said one, I, I did, you said one more, can I do more? Okay. One more before, but yeah, okay. How does right to repair? Ah, how does right to repair fit into the goals of the Software Freedom Conservancy? If it were not abundant yet for my talk, software freedom is the software right to repair. So in order to be able to repair any modern equipment, we need software freedom. You cannot effectively repair anything without being able to have the software right to repair. And what's cool about copyleft licensing and why I spent so much time on the Visio suit is that we have a right to repair in all of these Linux devices. I mean, the Visio TVs had, I forget how many um, different kinds of software on it. I think 22, 22 copylefted projects on it. It wasn't just the Linux kernel. Loads of software that give us these rights the rights to com get complete and corresponding source code and the scripts to control installation. So we should be able to do something about this, but we haven't been able to yet, in part because companies just don't do the right thing. They don't, they don't think about the fact that they have to publish their source code before they go to market. Then they go to market and they scramble. Um, in general, we, we, we've talked to loads and loads of companies about their non-compliance, and what turns out is that often, as I said, they don't even have the software themselves because they never asked for it from their vendors to begin with. And they didn't put the, if they developed it in-house, they didn't put the process in place to begin with, so they don't have the, the infrastructure in place. They don't even employ the employees that worked on, the developers that worked on that software back then. Those People have often left the company and moved on to other projects, and so they just don't even have the resources to be able to find that software later, which is terrifying because it means that if there's a problem with their products, they basically have to recall them. And there's nothing left that, that can be done. So in order for us to be sure that that changes, we have to be louder about it, and we have to make these companies realize that there is liability um, for their, um, you know, for their noncompliance because that will incentivize them to comply. Thank you very much. I'm sure there may be many more questions, and the more you talk, the more questions you uh, are evoking. But I was told that, uh, yeah, we should close the session after one hour. Maybe there are students that are still having to do some exams. I don't know. Wishing them good luck in that case, of course. But uh, most of all, uh, I would like to invite you to share with uh, me the applause for Karen once more. Thank you. And you know, 
you still have to perform more um, in two days, I think, the second, yeah, two days from now when you will get this honorary uh, award from our university. Someone else will give it to you. I would love to do it, but that's... Uh, we definitely need to hang out more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for being here and um, being here with Karen. Thanks so much. Thank you.